the U.S. housing crisis has grown into the global financial crisis. But how did we get here? Thomas Sowell is a scholar in residence at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He explains in his new book, The Housing Boom and Bust, this began years ago. You can really go back to the uh, Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, which was saying that the banks weren't lending enough money in, the, in their own immediate community or in all communities. But as time went on and as they began to get uh, studies done indicating that blacks were turned down for loans more so than whites, then, of course, they're energized and immediately there's a crusade to clamp down on the banks, tell them who they should lend to, require them to keep records, the income, the race, sex, everything of the people. And if the profile of those they lend to don't please the politicians, they're in trouble. The price of housing skyrocketed in some parts of the country, but not others. One of the crucial fallacies behind the housing boom and bust uh, is the belief that there was uh, a, a nationwide crisis of affordable housing. There was not. There were particular places, of which California is perhaps the worst example, of where the housing prices just shot up three times the national average. But why? Open space laws, uh, environmental laws, uh, historical preservation laws, farmland, pre you name it, somebody was out there coming up with reasons why you couldn't build anything in vast parts of California. In order to, to, to deal with this, these very high, extremely high local prices, uh, the politicians in Washington decided that they would have a national push for affordable housing. Well, the housing was more affordable at the time than it had been a decade earlier. So, so, so they set out to solve a problem that didn't exist, and they created a problem that did exist and still exists and may not be solved for years to come. So who is really responsible? There are a number of institutions that contributed to the housing boom and to the housing bust. Uh, the Federal Reserve is one of the most obvious since they set the interest rate. The interest rate is so important for people buying houses. A percent or two can mean the difference of thousands of dollars per year in mortgage payments and the difference between buying a home or not buying a home. When the interest rate is extremely low, that tempts many people to come in and buy houses that they really could not afford at a normal interest rate. So how did Fannie and Freddie play into all of this? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have, have a different role in that they are the ones who buy the mortgages from the banks or whoever else first makes the mortgage. And the rules that they set are the rules that the banks and the other lenders have to follow. Another uh, set of people are the people in Wall Street who also buy these mortgages, uh, great numbers of them, bundle them all together and issue bonds based on those mortgages. Uh, everything depends upon how solid the mortgages are, how safe they are, how, or how risky they are in this case. Did the government force banks to make risky loans? The federal agencies pushed the, bond, the uh, lenders and pushed Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac into making more risky mortgages because they had this mantra of affordable housing and greater home ownership. For a long time, Americans bought the line that the American dream is a big house filled with flat screen TVs, the granite countertops. During the boom, we ran up our debt and put our money in houses. The government told us it was okay. In fact, they told us it was patriotic. Then came the bust. 2006, housing prices went down for the first time in more than a decade, and they went by, down by huge amounts. It was nothing for the housing prices to go down by 20% uh, in one year. And that was only the beginning. The following year, it would go down another 20%, and then another 20%. San Diego is an extreme example. In one year, the average price of a home in San Diego fell by $200,000. A $500,000 home in January was $300,000 in December. But you still owed the $500,000 on a $300,000 home. Following the law of unintended consequences, the people hurt most by the bust? were the ones that ownership was supposed to help. Blacks, Hispanics, other minorities, uh, those are the people who were hit hardest. They, they were most likely to have to, have to go into default. Unless the person got a zero down payment loan, uh, they put some money into the house. And now when time comes when they can't uh, uh, pay the mortgage, uh, they lose all of that as well as having to move out. But why did people who didn't meet the standards set by banks, subprime borrowers, get loans in the first place? It was the regulators who insisted that the banks lend money to people who didn't meet the standards that the banks had always used. 
Uh, and so this then forced the banks into finding new ways of lending to those people. And so therefore, instead of having the 30-year fixed mortgage with a 20% down payment, which most of the people that the regulators wanted them to lend to didn't have any 20% down payment. Some politicians were the biggest cheerleaders. When the boom was going on, Barney Frank was very willing to say publicly that he was pushing. He said, we haven't pushed enough to get them to lend more, to do more for affordable housing. In a November 30th, 2006 interview with PBS Nightly Business Report, Barney Frank was asked, what's your top priority? Affordable housing is the single biggest one. We have a terrible housing crisis in this country, and I think we now understand that housing is not simply a social good, but it's an economic factor. The biggest difference people will see when we take over from the Republicans is we will reverse their policy of uh, basically letting any affordable housing stock dwindle and not building any new stock. Now, after the whole thing blew up, then Bonnie Frank is saying, uh, this is all due to too much reliance on the market, that uh, what we needed was more regulation. Well, it, w yes, you could use better regulation, but the regulation that we actually had was itself at the heart of the problem. How was Wall Street involved? And how did this spread around the world? The financing of, of, of these mortgages was nationwide and even international. In other words, a Wall Street firm would buy, buy up, say, say, a thousand mortgages. And then they would issue bonds based upon the value or assumed value of those thousand mortgages. And then they would sell them. And they would sell them not only uh, in Wall Street, but they'd be sold in China, Japan, London, wherever. And the people would buy them because the ratings agencies said that the, these were solid securities. But of course there was no, there was not enough knowledge available for people to know whether, what, whether they were safe or not. And the companies whose uh, solvency depended upon the value of these mortgages, many of them end, end up being insolvent and the taxpayers are then stuck with bailing them out. Virtually everybody has threw up a red flag. I even did a piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, in 2005 saying, you know, this, this whole thing could collapse like a house of cars. Uh, but more important, Alan Greenspan uh, and others uh, the head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation uh, warned them. The Secretary of the Treasury under Bush warned them. I mean, Fortune magazine warned them. Barron's warned them. The Economist magazine in London warned them. Everybody and his brother told them this wasn't going to last. They didn't want to hear it. And, the, and there was, uh, whatever the risks were to the taxpayers and to the economy, there was virtually no risk to the people who were pushing this. So where were the credit ratings agencies? Well, they in a sense did the best they could. It's just that the best they could wasn't very good. After all of this, have we learned anything? Unfortunately, the, the, the politicians have no incentive to learn from this. The last figures I checked, the Federal Housing Administration is still making mortgages with less than 4% down payment. And when you have no stake in the, in, in, in the, in the deal, the, the f first time there's any trouble, you simply stop paying and walk away. That was the whole reason for having big down payments in the first place. Lately, Americans are seeing rosy headlines, looking for a silver lining. But when is this really over? Uh, when it will stop, nobody knows. Uh, I suspect that the more they... Uh, more uncertainty they create, the more the banks will be, and others will be reluctant to lend, the more uh, people with money to invest will be reluctant to invest. Oh, we've been through all this before in the 1930s. Are the government's policies going to help or hurt? Are we headed for yet another Great Depression? Well, the government is doing everything it can to keep us from hitting the bottom. The problem is we don't know what the bottom is, and we're not going to find out until they let the bottom come in. There's been a study done uh, at UCLA uh, suggesting that the policies of the uh, New Deal prolonged the Great Depression by several years, despite the great myth that that, that was what got us out of the Depression. And I suspect that the, the, the Obama administration is following policies very much like those of the New Deal, and I suspect the result will be very much like what the New Deal produced. Which is to say, an economic disaster needlessly prolonged, but a political success unprecedented and that Roosevelt was elected four times. What happens if the economy continues to get worse? It may well be that the economy will, uh, will tank, but that it will be spun so beautifully that Obama will get reelected. What does America's future hold? I feel very uh, glad that I'm as old as I am because I may not live to see what it will hold.